face mask at all times in public spaces. Practice good hygiene by coughing or sneezing into your elbow, washing your hands with soap and water and sanitizing regularly. Register to get vaccinated. Together, we can beat COVID-19. BSABC, keeping you safe and informed. We are all connected. What unites us is our common humanity. I don't want to oversimplify things, but the suffering of a mother who has lost her child is not dependent on her nationality, ethnicity or religion. White, black, rich, poor, Christian, Muslim or Jew, pain is pain, joy is joy. We may be surprised at the people we find in heaven. God has a soft spot for sinners. His standards are quite low. Well, one of the multiple highlights of the life of Archbishop Desmond Mpilo Tutu is his time as the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. Now, during this time, he got to work with uh, and form a long-lasting relationship with uh, University of Pretoria, Professor Pete Mehring. He joins us now via Zoom. Professor Mehring, thank you so much for making the time to speak to us today. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to remember Desmond Tutu, remember his words. Yeah. He was the, indeed a good friend and a wonderful mentor. Absolutely. The Arch has publicly stated how he valued his relationship with you. Tell us about this relationship. Well, a uh, relationship uh, go back many years, about 45 years ago we met and we worked uh, on many projects over many years. Uh, Tutu was always very uh, supportive to people in the Dutch Reformed Church who had questions about the church's stance about apartheid in the 1970s, 1980s. There was a, a group of ministers from the church who tried to persuade the, the church to let go of the policy of apartheid, the theology of apartheid. And of course, we had the wind uh, uh, against us very often. But Tutu was so supportive and he made time to be with us. I remember when he returned from the uh, funeral of the Swedish Prime Minister. Uh, he left all his luggage on at the airport to come and speak to a number of Germanys in Pretoria just to be with us and to encourage us on our way. I asked him at the meeting, uh, but Arch, if you were a Dumini in the Enghia Kerk like us, what would you say to the people in the pew? And he laughed out loud the way he did. And he said, well, the Lord in his providence just decided that he should not be a Dumini in the Enghe Kerk. Just imagine that that would have brought to the church. But he said, if I were to be a Dumini in the church, I'd speak about three things. Firstly, about personal faith, because you need that. And secondly, about hope, because we need hope. And he said, I can well imagine that white Afrikaners in the late uh, 1980s, when the winds of change were blowing, were very uh, fearful of, about the, the future. I'll speak about hope. But then he said, uh, my third series of, of sermons would be, let go of apartheid. That's what caused all the problems. I always, I many times thought about it, that in our, our time, we also need uh, Tutu's admonitions. Firstly, I think we need to, speak to people about personal faith and about hope and we need to speak about injustice in society as hard and as often as we can but you speak about the truth commission and about my relationship or how i got on the trc i only later heard that uh, nelson mandela the president and uh, archbishop tutu thought it was very very necessary that somebody from the africana community especially somebody from the Ministry of the Enghia Kerk should serve on the Truth Commission. But I was sitting in my office at the Faculty of Theology in Pretoria one day in January 1995, when my, 1996, when my telephone rang and I picked it up and I heard the famous voice say, Pitt, are you sitting down? This is Desmond speaking. And then he told me I was appointed to serve on the TRC 
and uh, as I was catching my breath and while I was saying um and ah, he said to me in a very stern voice, you know, Pete, I am still the Archbishop of Cape Town and I speak for the Lord God. And the Lord says, you have to come, but you have five, day, five days to decide. So I landed on the Truth Commission and it was a, a very inspiring, a very sometimes agonizing, but also a, a, a thought-provoking, inspiring uh, adventure yeah. to be with Desmond Tutu and all the other commissioners on the way of the TRC. Prof, I'm supposed to keep my composure. You can't make me laugh too much. Now, not only, not only were you two members of the TRC, but you're both men of the cloth. You're an ordained minister of the Dutch Reformed Church, which you've just spoken uh, about, uh, which for a long time was viewed as anti-black. Uh, was the friendship organic or were you trying to make, were you two trying to make a bigger point? Well, uh, can I just make a point about uh, uh, Tutu's uh, uh, personal faith? Because before I answer that, to me as a Dominican in the Ingekerk, it came as a real inspiration to see how serious the arch took his personal faith. Uh, he often spoke about it, but he also practiced it. Uh, I only later learned that every single day at one o'clock in the day, Tutu makes time for meditation and for prayer where the TRC was on its way and something on its hectic way, wherever we were uh, on, at one o'clock when other people went for lunch, Tutu would go apart and to close the door behind him to pray and to meditate. I remember at the, at the Cebu King hearing, which was a, a very, very uh, hectic hearing, one lunchtime I saw the arch disappear and uh, enclose himself in a telephone booth that was the only place where there was quiet for him to pray. But coming to your question about uh, Tutu and the Ingeker, it, it's wonderful that Tutu, who was absolutely hostile towards apartheid and very, very uh, against, uh, harsh in his criticism of the Dutch Reformed Church's stance on apartheid, never gave up on the church. And as I said, uh, in the beginning where there were a, a number of Dominis who started to talk against apartheid to try to get the church to, to change its stance. He was there for us in so many ways. And when the Dutch Reformed Church made its turn, uh, Tutu uh, was the first person to say, I, I accept the apology of the church. In 1990, uh, after the change came in South Africa, there was a professor, Willy Jonker, who spoke, spoke at the big Rustenburg conference where all the faith communities came together. And he said, I need to apologize for apartheid for my own sake, but also for the sake of my church and of the Afrikaner people. And while other people thought whether they should take it seriously, Tutu was the first to embrace him. Later, uh, in 1996, to the moderator of, when the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, Freek Spanepoel, had to appear before the TRC and to explain the difficult part path of the Dutch Reformed Church uh, with apartheid over so many years and also reiterated the apology of apartheid and telling how the church at long length came to the point where it declared apartheid a sin and a heresy and apologized for the pain and suffering that it caused. When Freek Swanepoel spoke about that, Tutu got up and the, the chairperson of the, of the hearing embraced him and asked him to pray. And he said, uh, uh, Freak, uh, I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad that you came to speak to us. He said, I always tell the devil, pass up, here come the NG Kerk, beware. You and him are so similar in that way, always throwing in a quip in a serious conversation. But you say something interesting that he was hostile towards apartheid and uh, uh, as black South Africa many people would like to think he was fighting for black South Africa are you saying he was fighting for everyone because I'm interested to hear as you say there was a need for convincing people uh, in the Enchiekerk of this new yeah. vision this new way of being this inclusive reconciliatory way of being how personally did you take some of his very uh, 
public statements about apartheid and sometimes towards uh, white people and the people that you led in the Enkhiekerk. Take us through the sentiment and the feeling at that time. I think that uh, he, he's, he's very strong statements against apartheid and the way in which he, he made no twos about it, that apartheid was wrong and it was sinful and it was uh, that the church's uh, theology of apartheid was heretical. It came as a shock, of course, to many people in the, in the church and uh, the rank and file in the church initially saw Tutu as one of the enemies of the church. But to me and to many of my, my colleagues, it came really as a, as a strong uh, admonition. It made us think. It made us think very hard about what we always believed in the past. And he helped me and many others to make to turn our ways and to have another way of thinking at things. And you have been quoted previously as saying, through the love of Christ, reconciliation will come about what are your thoughts about reconciliation as uh, we mark the departure of the son of the soil? In 1994, when the new South Africa came into being, all of us uh, thought about the rainbow nation and we had high hopes for reconciliation. And uh, during the TRC, it happened in many wonderful ways. I was uh, 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 witnessing a number of unforgettable experiences where victims and perpetrators were brought uh, together and by the grace of God, uh, reconciliation took place. But Tutu always told us that remember reconciliation is not an event, it is a process. And uh, it's a long and arduous process. And uh, I, I agree with Tutu in his disappointment that we are not much farther on the way of, of reconciliation. So, so much has to be done, especially in South Africa today. But the, the interesting thing is uh, that Tutu never uh, s s uh, gave up on people. He was strong against uh, structures and about uh, ideologies. But the Afrikaner people, he never gave up. He spoke to people in Afrikaans. He came to our church and he, he delivered a wonderful sermon in Afrikaans. He uh, was very much against, as I said, against the Dutch Reformed Church and the other Afrikaans churches' views on apartheid. But he never gave up on the churches. And when the churches were ready to uh, mend their ways, he was the first to embrace them and to help them, help them along. He did not only speak about reconciliation and forgiveness. He was the embodiment of reconciliation and forgiveness. I remember one day... Uh, when uh, a wonderful uh, experience of reconciliation took place in Port Elizabeth. He phoned me uh, after that and we spoke about it. And then he said, after we, we rejoiced in this wonderful bit of news, what happened the previous evening, he said to me, Pete, now close your eyes. We're going to pray together. And I sat with my phone in the office of the TRC in Johannesburg with a, a telephone to my ear. And he was holding his telephone in Cape Town and he addressed, he prayed a most wonderful prayer that I wrote down the best I could afterwards. A prayer addressed to the God of surprises who continues to surprise us with what's happening in our country today. Prof, as a result of your work at the uh, commission, you then got invited to serve on reconciliation structures in other countries, including Rwanda. What are your final thoughts about the efficacy of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa? <laughs> Let me just correct. Uh, I was not uh, on the... On the uh, we were, a number of us were invited to Rwanda to advise the Rwandese uh, President Kagame and the others on, on the way they may take. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that uh, the, the TRC made news all over the world and almost all the members of the TRC was, were invited afterwards to go to other places to advise uh, some of us to serve on uh, uh, commissions for reconciliation and for truth. Uh, but but uh, the, the interesting thing is the, in, in um, uh, all the other countries in the world uh, where they had similar problems and in Canada, wherever, 
they they ask us now give us the method tell us how to do it and uh, we often were a bit embarrassed to say to them well we don't have all the answers uh, actually the trc also came under criticism some people thought it was great there were other people who thought it was not so great and we don't have a, a, a method that will work in every single country but we do have stories to we do have an experience and let us tell us how we did it and uh, maybe you can learn from that an absolute um, an absolute honor to, an absolute honor to speak to you and as a friend let's also send you our condolences on the passing of your good friend oh, the archbishop thank you and my heart goes my heart goes out to Leah and the children. It is, they were such a wonderful uh, thing in the life of our family. The Maiden family would have been much the poorer without the Tutu family's love. Thank you again for your time, Professor Pete Mehring, a friend and a colleague to the late Archbishop Desmond Mbilo Tutu. Now, the Diocese of Johannesburg and the City of Johannesburg will have a midday prayer service and laying of flowers at the Tutu House in Soweto. Mathako Komane is in Soweto. A very good morning to you, uh, uh, Mathako. You're coming to us from that street that has housed uh, two uh, of the uh, most uh, eminent citizens of the world. Uh, what's happening as you're there? Yes, indeed. Good morning to you, Desiree, and uh, the listeners at home. Indeed, we are waiting for a wreath-laying ceremony as well as a you know, candle-lighting ceremony that is um, taking place here that um, is happening between the city as well as the diocese, as you've correctly stated. Um, you know, this is, has been open to the public. We heard that announcement uh, happening, uh, and, you know, that announcement that was made yesterday, um, you know, by the Johannesburg Diocese to say that they will be um, carrying out out a, a program for the week alongside um, the city of Johannesburg just to honor um, you know the the, the arc and also um these various programs will be taking place between here as well as um, the St. Mary's Cathedral in Wanderer Street in Johannesburg and um, you know certain streets leading up to Wanderers within the city have been closed uh, for those that will be having those services. I know there is also one tonight but um, right now you know I'm, let, let me just walk out of shot and just walk with Byron here. There is also people have been signing um, condolences you know, there's a condolence book here that is also being signed uh, by people as they're coming. We're also seeing a lot of tourists also, I think, also just engaging as to what is it that is happening here. Also quite interested. I suppose they will also be, um, understand some of them will be staying, sticking around for, for this particular uh, service for, for today. We understand that on the program today would be two neighbors because we are just outside uh, the Tutu home here in Orlando West. Um, two neighbors will be speaking as well as the mayor of the city of Johannesburg, Dr. Mpopelazi, um, as well as the bishop will also be taking um He'll also be taking the, the, the stage later on, or rather the podium, and speaking. And I'm just going to, we're just going to walk a bit and just show you um, just some of the flowers that have been laid here. This is where uh, the laying of the wreaths will take place. And as you can see, um, you know, the ladies, Abu Mama Bomchandas, Bumebasaparo, as we would call them in Sepedi, um, here members of the church, as well as just some of the flowers or the wreaths that have been laid here. Um, during uh, th since the death was announced here um as well as you know the various messages that would would go with that but this program is expected to start at midday and the public as a whole is 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 invited to be part of that and we also understand that in fact they are encouraged as well residents of this particular area those that have have lived with this man with with the ark and um you know have shared times with him we know obviously um he, the rich history that he has so this is an event that is open to the public and i i, I it's already filling up from when we we got here so we're expecting to start at about um, 12 o'clock just waiting uh, for the executive mayor of the city to come and um, so the program can start we understand as I said at 12 o'clock today Desiree Masaku, thank you so much for setting the scene for us and uh, uh, we will be coming back uh, as soon as uh, official proceedings begin there
Uh, South Africans continue to pay tribute to late Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Some have uh, been writing messages of condolences, while others have been laying wreaths at the St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town. SABC reporter Lulama Macha has the latest. Lulama, what's happening in Cape Town? Uh, thanks, Desiree. Yes, um, it's nearly 12 o'clock now. It's quarter to 12, actually. And we know that at 12 o'clock, the bells uh, start here to ring for 10 minutes. And I can see now uh, scores of people coming in uh, to witness uh, this, 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 this process. And uh, we're going to take a tour, Desiree, inside the church where the body of Arch will be... Uh, will lie in state for two days, starting uh, from tomorrow, which is the 30th of December, and Friday, the 31st. Uh, public viewing is expected uh, to start at 9 o'clock until uh, 5 o'clock for two days. Outside the church, Desri, the cameraman is going to look at here how they are celebrating uh, Arch. We see some of the quotations from him. There's a one that says, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. The church is saying that, as I walk in, Desri, is saying that these quotations they've put in when they were celebrating um, his uh, 90th birthday in October this year. We are inside the church, the church now, uh, where his body will lie uh, in state, but unfortunately, Daddy, Desri, uh, the lights um, are not all uh, switched on. It's pretty dark uh, in front, so we cannot see properly. But we can see that there are some people who are coming here uh, every day um, to be part of the process because there's going to be, um, a, as the bells are ringing uh, on the other side, uh, inside the church, there will be people who will be a uh, part of the ceremony listening here. Uh, there's not much uh, decoration inside. Uh, it's the normal decor that the church has, except that uh, the passing of arch happened over the festive season. Um, if Marcus can zoom in on his uh, left-hand side, uh, we will see that um, because we were celebrating Christmas recently on, and uh, the birth of, of Jesus Christ, uh, the church uh, had some of the, of the symbols uh, indicating um, the, birth, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. So that's all uh, we can show you for now inside the church as we are rushing uh, Desiree to the to the uh, back of the church where the ringing of the bells uh, will happen at uh, 12 o'clock. Okay, let's let you go then, Lulu. Thank you so much uh, for showing us just in terms of setting the scene for what will be happening any moment now. Now the Anglican